There are some things in life, if you neglect it, it's not that big of a deal. If you don't wash your car, it's not that big of a deal. Other people may talk about you in the community, talk about how nasty your car is, but it's not going to change whether your engine runs and things like that. There are things that just don't matter if we neglect them, but there are things in life that matter very much. Like if we neglect forgiveness, then maybe we can't live free. Maybe people that we're in a relationship with can't live free. And so there are things we need to make sure that we don't neglect. And that's why we decided to do this series. Last week was neglected forgiveness. This week we're going to talk about neglected confession. Now I have, I have a confession that I need to make. I, I'm not excited about doing this at all uh, because I'm afraid some of you may lose respect in me. Uh, maybe some of you will stop listening to me. I, I don't know, but I, I feel like there's something I've just got to get off my chest, and I need to make a confession to you guys this morning. How many of you are paying attention? Right? Y'all ready, aren't you? You're like, man, what is he going to say? I'm not confessing anything. I, I, I just wanted to get your attention. I, I don't have anything that I really need to confess today, but we love confessions, right? Especially if it's other people and it's famous people, actors, actresses, musicians, politicians. If they begin to confess, man, we are listening. We're buying People magazine. We're watching TV shows. We want to see what the latest confession is for people. And that's for others, but not really for us. But we like other people's confessions. There is uh, a phone line called Connection Confession where you can call and for $9 for three minutes, you can confess your sins, the deepest, darkest sins that you have. And if you're willing to pay extra, you can listen to other people's confessions as well. One of the uh, men that got this uh, phone line started said it this way. It's a technological way to get something off your chest without the embarrassment that comes from confessing one-on-one. -on -one. Makes it a lot easier, right, if there doesn't have to be a human being involved. Candy Chang, she is an artist and an urban developer who likes to do different art projects. And so she set up a confession booth on the strip in Las Vegas. You're going to get a chance to see this. And all she did was go in and set up these confession booths. And people were asked to go inside and they got a wooden tile and they could confess anything. And then they could take that confession, drop it in a slot, and no one would ever know what they wrote on there. And then she was going to turn this into an art project. By the time she got done with it, there were over 1,500 confessions that people had made. Let me share some with you. So one person said, I cheat on my taxes. Another, I can't stand my brother-in-law. I'm a compulsive liar, but I can't stop. I cheated on my husband, and I don't regret it one bit. Another said, I'm getting married in four weeks, but I'm in love with my best friend. Still another, I'm addicted to cheating. I'm sorry. Another, I almost killed someone. Another, I do crazy drugs. And everyone thinks I'm some put-together professional. I'm leading a double life. I love drugs. Others said, I lie to my husband all the time. Or sometimes I feel embarrassed by my brother because he has a disability. Others, I've cheated on every girlfriend I've ever had except this one so far. How about this one? I stole from a church. Another, I attempted suicide when I was 13, using 40 pills. Sometimes I kind of wished it worked. Others were short. I'm a liar. I'm high. I hate myself. I watch porn. I had an abortion. I used to cut myself every day. One said, everyone in my life thinks that I recovered from addictions, but I haven't. How about this one? I sold heroin to my best friend, and it ruined his life. This one said, I've stolen over 15000 from the company I work for. Told my doctor I'm anxious just so he'd give me the really good drugs. And one of the saddest, I have no clue who I am. I'm lost. I'm living a lie, and everyone is buying it. 
So we love the idea of confession. In fact, it's been said for years, confession is good for the soul, right? Well, for other people, but not for us, because we don't want to admit the weaknesses that we have. We don't want to admit the sins that we have. And so we put this picture-perfect image of who we are out there. We, we want to make sure that when people look at us, they see this person that is put together, that has everything lined up. Their life looks so good, especially when you come to church. So we wear this facade. So that nobody can see the real us. But that's not what God calls us to. God calls us to vulnerability. God calls us to, to bear our sins to each other. To, to open up. Because when we do, then we can experience God's grace. We can experience God's forgiveness. But for many people, especially Christians that are regular in church, it's a neglected confession that most of us experience. Instead of confession, Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13 says this, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. See, what we need to understand is unconfessed sin is what breaks the relationship that we have with God. That when we have these things that are inside and they're just churning us up and we don't feel good about the person that we see in the mirror, when we keep that stuff in, our relationship with God is going to be strained and Satan uses that. And he tells you God will forgive that. God cannot look past that. And if he gets you thinking that way, then he can make you very, very ineffective in your Christian walk. So instead of neglecting confession, I believe we need to embrace confession. I want us to look at a passage of scripture. It's actually one verse in particular that I want us to look at. You've read it already, but I want us to set it up by reading a few verses before that. So would you go back to 1 John chapter 1? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 is going to be our key verse, but I want us to go back and pick up uh, some verses before we get to verse 9, and we're going to begin in verse 5, because John wants to set up the situation for us so that we understand God, we understand sin, and we understand ourselves. 1 John chapter 1, let's begin in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So before we get to that verse 9, understand John lays it out and says, listen, there's two areas that you can live in in your life. You can live in the light or you can live in the dark. He says God is light. That's where God lives. But when we are sinners, we live in the dark. But when we come to God through Jesus Christ, he will purify us from that sin and we can move from darkness into light. And so he wants us to understand you choose. You can't play both sides. You can't live in light and live in darkness as well. You're a liar if you say that you can do that. If you say you don't have sin, you're a liar. All of us sin. Most of us sin every day, multiple times a day. And so he sets it up. Here's where you've got to choose to be in light or to be in darkness. Where are you going to be? Then he brings in this verse 9, though. I love this verse. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's a short verse, but there is so much in there. So I want us to take it part by part. I want us to really allow God to speak to us through this verse today. So let's just break it down. He starts off by saying, if we confess our sins. All right, confession is on us. It is our responsibility. That's what we're called to do, to actually confess our sin. Confession means to agree with God. 
to agree with God that sin is sin and I have sin in my life, but we have a tendency to call sin by other names. Like we'll say, you know, I admire that person, but really you're envious. Or we say, well, you know what, I'm just being a man, but no, it's called lust. Or maybe you say, I have a justifiable dislike of that person. No, it's called hatred. Or maybe you say, no, it's just a little white lie. No, it's called deceit. It's called sin. And when we confess, we own our sin. We call it for what it is. It is sin. And he says, if we confess our sins, so it's on us. It's not on God. It's not on somebody else. Confession of sin is on us. We own that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Who is the he that John is talking about, do you think? God? Okay. God is faithful and just. When we confess our sins, he is faithful. In other words, you can trust God. That God is going to be there even when you confess your sins. He's not going to turn his back on you. He's going to be there for you. If you read the Bible, especially you go back to the Old Testament and you read the story of the Jewish people. Man, God was faithful to them so much. In prison and in slavery for 40 years in Egypt. I mean, excuse me, 400 years in Egypt. God rescues them, brings them out, and through their 40 years of wandering in the desert, he takes care of them. He gives them food. He gives them water. He fights battles for them to where they don't even have to do the fighting. God was so faithful to them, even though they were sinful, he was still there. I think about Daniel. Daniel was a man who had been taken to a foreign country, but he had done well in the government and he was working in the government, but they told him that he could not pray to anybody. He couldn't pray to his own God. He could only pray to the king and it was a law and Daniel said, I'm not going to stop praying. And so every day he went into his room and he prayed and they went and told the king. And because of that, Daniel had to be thrown into a lion's den. And I'm not talking about trained lions. I'm not talking about lions that somebody raised from a cub and they might be nice. I'm talking about lions that they would abuse and starve so that when anything alive came into that den, they're going to attack it and they're going to eat it. Daniel was thrown in. And yet that next morning when the king called out to him, he said, hey, I'm fine. And he pulled Daniel out. God had closed the mouths of those lions. He had been faithful to Daniel. Because Daniel had been faithful to him. There were three guys that lived at the same time. In fact, were taken captive the same time as Daniel. Daniel was their friend. Their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And because they did not bow to an idol, they were thrown into a furnace. A furnace that was so hot that the people who threw them in died instantly. That's how hot it was. And yet they were in that furnace, and instead of screaming and rolling around on the ground, being killed, they were walking around, and there was somebody in there with them. And they, the people watching even thought, that is a God that is in there with them. And when they were brought out, it said that their hairs weren't singed. They didn't even smell like smoke. God was faithful to them because he was, they were faithful to him. We can trust God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, in other words, he's going to do what's right all the time. You and I, we kind of flounder. We may treat people one way today and another way tomorrow. And, and we might be a little wishy-washy, but not God. God is just. He always does what is right. So if we will confess, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I love that idea of forgiveness. It's the idea of to put away that God takes our sin and he puts it away. And, and he, he pays the price for that so that we are accountable for our sin. That's why he allowed Jesus to die. That's why Jesus went to the cross so that you and I could receive the forgiveness of of sins. That was his purpose for coming into the world. And if we will confess our sin because of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, our sins will be forgiven. Jesus paid the price. Somebody had to pay the price for your sin. 
Instead of it being you, Jesus said, I'll take it on me so that they can be forgiven. I love the idea uh, of forgiveness. How about you all? You like that idea? Yeah. I do. But listen, he takes it a step further. If we will confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I love this part. You need to understand what he's saying is not only does God forgive us for our sins, but he removes the stain that that sin caused. He, he removes the blemishes that are on us. And so once again, we can be clean. If I like the sound of that, not only are you forgiven, but God cleans you. He purifies you himself. Romans chapter 10 and verse 11 says anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. See, guilt and shame are the things that I believe we are purified from. Because that's the things that we hold on to when God forgives us. We say, I, I know he forgave me, but I still feel guilty. I know he forgave me, but I, I've got so much shame in me. And the idea is he not only forgives, but he purifies us. Listen to what one writer said. Confession has been described by Augustine as a daily baptism. That is, each time we confess our wrongdoing, we die to that part of our old self. Then leaving our sin, shame, and guilt behind, we are washed clean by the mercy of God, and we are free to rise from that moment to a renewed life, reconciled to God. Listen to this. Free of any unresolved guilt and released from lingering shame. Does that sound good, family? Man, it's one thing for God to forgive us and say, all right, I'm going to push that away as far as the east is from the west. That's how far I'm going to remove your sin from you. But for God to purify us, to take that guilt and that shame away, that should feel like a huge weight lifted off of us. So let me put it all together in one statement that I want you to remember. It's simply this. Confession releases God's forgiveness and frees us from guilt and shame. When we confess our sins, that releases the forgiveness from God that Jesus Christ bought with his own death on the cross. And then we are freed from guilt and shame. But listen, that is the message that Satan does not want you to hear today. And I need you to hear this message. When you confess your sins, it releases God's forgiveness. But more than that, it frees, it purifies you from your guilt and shame. If we get that in our minds, if Christians will hear that and believe it, we will no longer walk through life as prisoners. Satan will not be able to whisper in our ear, wait, 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 no, 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 no. You know what you did. God hasn't forgotten what you did. Your family hasn't forgotten what you did. Your neighbors, the people that grew up with you, they know what you did. But when we confess it, when we get it out, when, when we don't hold it inside anymore, that shame, that guilt, we're freed from that. We are purified from that. So if we're going to talk about confession, maybe the question you have is the same question I had. So who do we confess to? Well, obviously we confess to God. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is talking about. We confess. We confess our sins to God. We're moving from darkness into light. We say, God, here's the things that I've got going on in my life. Please forgive me of those. Not only does he forgive, but he purifies. That's why I love that we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. That is my time. When I sit and I think back over the week and I say, God, please forgive me for my mouth. Please forgive me for not being patient. Please forgive me. Whatever I can remember, I ask God to forgive me for it. And when he does, I can be free from that guilt and that shame. We confess to God, but I think we got to go a step farther than that. I believe we confess to each other. I believe we need to, at times, confess to a person, to a human being. Now, I'm not making this up. This is not my idea. This is a God thing. In James chapter 5, James is going to talk about prayer. 
Is going to talk about calling on the elders to pray for you and that healing can come. But it's in James chapter 5 and verse 16 that it says this. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Do you see that? Look at the first part of that. Therefore, confess your sins to who? Each other. And now that's a little bit of a stretch, right? Confessing to God in a prayer and privacy in my own home, in my own mind, that's one thing. But now James steps it up a level and he says, you need to confess to each other. Why? And isn't it good enough to confess to God once I've poured that out? Isn't that okay? Well, here's the thing. When you confess to a person, they can hold you accountable. They can help you not fall back into that sinful thing that you've asked God to forgive you for. Because just because you ask God to forgive you doesn't mean Satan's going to leave you alone. Right? If that's a temptation, man, Satan's going to keep, he's going to try to push it into your court every time that he can. He's going to try to get you thinking about it. And so when you tell a person, they can help hold you accountable. They can remind you of the faithfulness of God. They can help you, okay, look, let's read scripture. Let's make sure that you're reading some verses and you're in God's word every day so that you can be strong. So that when God is faithful to you, you can be faithful to him. So that when Satan brings this stuff up, you can ignore Satan. You can do what needs to be done. And when you tell it to somebody, it allows them to pray for you. That's what that verse said. Confess your sins to each other and pray for one another. Listen to me. Confession should bring prayer, not gossip. Y'all hear me? Let me say that again in case you didn't get it. Confession should bring prayer, not gossip. But there's times we like, ooh, I got the scoop. And we do prayer gossip. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Listen, I need y'all to pray for so-and-so. Cheated on his wife. You're not worried about praying for him. You're worried about telling everybody that the person cheated on the wife. Confession should bring prayer, not gossip. But when we do confess to each other and we pray for each other, man, that's when we get stronger. That's when Satan cannot use those things. That's when we're purified from our guilt and our shame. That's why we confess to each other. And remember, Satan doesn't want you to know that. Do you want to be forgiven today? Confess. Do you want to be purified today? Confess. Do you want to live free today? Confess. Do you want to be healed today? Confess. Confess your sin to God. Confess your sin to someone else. So what's my challenge for you this week? My challenge is that you find somebody, somebody that you can trust, and you confess to them things that are keeping you from being closer in a relationship with God. Things that you are guilty over, that you're ashamed about, and they are just keeping you from being the man or woman that God is calling you to be. And you need to find a trustworthy person that you can share that with. Listen, I've got several in my life. Amanda is line one. I can confess anything to her because I know she's not going anywhere. She loves me and I also knows she knows me better than anybody else in the world. So she knows when there's something going on. But not only Amanda, I have Philip Murdoch as well. Philip and I do the same thing. We're both preachers. We're in ministry. We understand things that none of you guys understand because you're not a preacher. And so we're able to talk and hold each other accountable and confess things to each other. And then I also have my dad. My dad's not just my dad, he's my best friend. And so we talk all the time. We talk about things. And I know my dad loves me enough that he will call me on the carpet, but he'll never take his love away. I don't have to worry about him not loving me, no matter what I confess. And so I've got people in my life that I can confess to on a regular basis. Do you? You need to. Because confession releases God's forgiveness and frees you from guilt and shame. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't do well with guilt and shame. I just don't do well with it. And so I want it gone. I don't want it to be a part of my life. Remember, confession releases God's forgiveness and frees us from guilt and shame. So I'm going to encourage you to do that. To come clean to God. Come clean to somebody else. To confess your sins. To no longer allow Satan to have a stranglehold on your life. But to get those things out. And I think you will be amazed how free you will feel 
at that point. They say confession is good for the soul. <coughs> and it absolutely is. Man and I have confessed things to each other. Things that were extremely hard to tell each other from our past. And yet it was the most incredible feeling. In fact, I, I told Mandy something that I have never told another human being in my life. But when I did, it was just not carrying that anymore. It's gone. You confess. You release God's forgiveness. And you are free from guilt and shame. Does that sound good to you? If it does, do something today. Now, I'm going to scare you to death, but there may be somebody here today that needs to confess before this congregation. I believe that confession before your church is something that is talked about in Scripture. People came, they confessed their sins, they were baptized, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that's what we do. We not only confess that we believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, which that's the basis for everything else, but we may need to come and say, I need people to hold me accountable. I gotta confess this. I gotta get this off my conscience because I cannot be effective in God's kingdom until it's gone. And maybe you need to do that today. And maybe you're thinking, you have lost your mind. I may have. But I guarantee you, if you confess, either to God, either to God and to somebody, you're gonna live free. And you may be freer than you have been in a long, long time. You need to accept Jesus for the first time. We give you that opportunity today. If you just need to talk to God right where you are about things that you need to let go of, do that right where you are. You need us to pray for you. We'll do that publicly. We'll do that privately. And we want you to feel God's forgiveness and peace. We'll pray for you about that. If you want to be a part of this church family, we just ask you that you're an immersed believer. If you are, we'll welcome you to this family. But we're going to sing a chorus uh, that we've been singing for many, many years called He is Lord. And that's really about what we're talking about, God being the Lord of our lives and not us. And so we're going to sing uh, two uh, stanzas of this chorus. We're going to do an acapella this morning. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And would you sing with me as we think about decisions we need to make? He is Lord. 